All right, wargaming enthusiasts, we've got an incoming question here. Fritz, being a narrative player myself, how do you win with a weaker army? How do you win with a weaker army? That's what we're going to explore. And we're, we're talking about this at a very, very high level as opposed to jumping into specific systems, say, like X-Wing Miniatures, Warhammer 40,000, Battletech, because the idea is is looking at this from a top-level, high-level perspective, if you can build a checklist of questions and then bolt those questions into your army, faction, armada, and the rule set, you'll get your answers. And it'll position you in a good place, a, a solid, solid place. So when we look at a rule set, when we look at a miniature gaming system rule set, the idea is it is trying to create a simulation of a narrative. And it not only defines what you can and can't do, but there's also a, a probability slash random engine in there that might be through a D6, it might be through D8, it might be through action cards. But the idea is you are in a framework of things that you can do and can't do. Some systems are very good at simulating this. You know, Some are a little bit looser or not so good. You absolutely can't do everything. That's called a role-playing game. So a perfect example would be if I'm a tank is moving forward, I can attack with that tank based on the weapon profile. But if infantry starts swarming it, is it in the rules that I could pop the hatch and throw out a couple of grenades? No, but in a role-playing game, I could. So what you're going to find these stress points or these parts in the rules where just you come up against a virtual wall, you can't do that. What this means is units in the game, based on the history, whether it's historical, real historicals, or whether it's just made up narrative, there are going to be certain units that are better than others in the rules, certain units that are a little bit more powerful. Now, in an ideal game, this, this matrix of here's what a unit is good at, here's what it's not good at, is, is balanced out in comparison to other rules and other units. So the idea is if I'm taking low quality penal legion type troops, yes, elite troops are going to just destroy them, but I'm paying a lot less in points or battle value or squadron points, whatever it's going to be. And if I utilize that unit correctly, then I'll have that advantage. Where this falls apart is some rule systems are constantly changing the variables of their units because they say, well, in this moment, I want to sell these miniatures because I just released it. So I'm going to make the rules so hype and I'm going to make the rules so amazing that they just crush everything and they adjust back and forth. We're going to put that aside for a moment. So we've got this rule set. You've got your units. As you go through and you see that there are certain units that are really good, certain units that are not so good. And certain units that they wanted to include in the rules because it makes sense, but maybe the rules don't really support it. Uh, an example would be maybe you're playing a game where there's a unit that's a type of artillery, but the actual rules for artillery aren't really implemented that well in the simulation. So naturally that unit, while it's represented on the table and makes sense in the narrative, it's, it's just not really going to work as intended. You're going to get an idea of what's good and not good. Now we jump over, there are many ways to play wargaming systems. And we see this out of, outside of historical wargaming systems where you approach the system, we have power points, squadron points, battle value, currency, crowns, whatever it's going to be, gold pieces. You buy your stuff, I buy my stuff, we come together on the table. Some people will play a game based on pure whack, win at all costs. They will look at an army and say, what's the most efficient, what's the most efficient unit, the most efficient model on the table? And they will just copy and paste that, even if it goes against the narrative. You know, a perfect example might be there's this, you're reading the narrative and it's like this elite unit of commandos. There are only 100 in the entire army. And of that 100, they're scattered out throughout the war zone. So you might have 10 in any given battlefield, planetary battlefield. They're so elite. You're like, I'm going to take a home and take 500 of these things because I can in, in the army lists and the rules. And they're so amazing where the designers might have intended to say, hey, look, you know, have one because it's special. But the simulation lets you take more. So you see these copy and paste army lists on one extreme. On the other extreme, you see players that say 
And I tend to fall into this category. And I say that as there's no right or wrong. You just need to know what you're getting involved with. Narrative players, people that say, for whatever reason, um, I like this type of army and I want to play it. And it's not that optimal. A couple of examples in different systems through the years, playing um, my jet bike Viper Samhan Eldar army. For whatever reason, I'm like, I want to play all jet bikes. I don't, I don't even know when I made the army. I'm like, I don't even know how they operate. I just want to get the maximum jet bikes down on the table. And the piece uh, the Viper at the time, which is like a big jet bike, looked really cool. So I'm like, I just want lots of those. I didn't even know how they worked on the table. Um, another example with Battletech, I like lots and lots of tanks. I like the urban mech. There's certain units I want to throw down on the table just on visuals or weapon profiles. So you come up with whatever play style you want. Warhammer 40,000, corny glory, close combat glory. You can have your fancy plans. You can have your big guns. I'm going to run across the table. And I'm going to engage you in close combat and put you to the chainsword and the bolt pistol. So I wanted lots and lots of berserkers running across the table. How do we make that work? So that's approaching it possibly from the perspective of a weaker army. Because no one intentionally takes a weak army. You don't sit out to make a list and say, well, let me make something weak. You might try to do something special. You might have a narrative where you're like, I love this narrative. I love these models. So this pulls in. So let's approach it. We've got that framework leading into it. The checklist that you're going to build is you're going to look and say what, based on the other units that you're going to fight, the other pieces, armies, armada, spaceships, robots, whatever it's going to be in your list, what are you vulnerable against? What are you vulnerable against? What are you vulnerable that you're going to face? So I'm going to pull in my Berserker army for a second. I know we weren't going to talk about systems, but we're going to talk about the concept. I have tons and tons of infantry Berserkers moving across the table. Warhammer 40,000 being a shooting game slash close combat game, as I run across the table, you're going to be shooting at me. You're not going to meet me out unless you're similar glory, but you're going to sit there, dig in, and shoot me. I'm going to take losses... Turn by turn, turn one, I'm running. Turn two, I'm running. Turn three, I hit your front lines. By the time I hit your front lines, I've taken two rounds of shooting. Do I have enough models left? Do I have enough of my berserkers left to to effectively charge? Well, no, I'm vulnerable. Okay, so we're building this checklist. I am vulnerable to shooting as I run across the table because I want to get you base-to-base, close combat to close combat, bolt, pistol, and chainsword. Building that tactica, how do I make myself less vulnerable? Can I mech up? Can I transport up with APCs and other troop transports? So not only do I cut down and hit you on turn two instead of turn three, but I can protect myself from small arms fire and other aspects of the game. Okay, I'm going to take still take some losses because there's going to be some anti-tank weapons and, and other things. But the question now is... I have to spend battle value. I have to spend my game currency on those transports. Is that taking away from the list? Second aspect. So I need something to counter the fact that you're going to be shooting me. I can do it with transports. Um, Another way, and I I went both directions for flexibility and, and fun. Another way is to look and say, well, if my core troops are these berserkers, these chaos space marine berserkers, then what if I threw out some trash mobs ahead of time? Um, in the various books at different times, there were cultists, which are just like renegade soldiers or, or misguided imperial citizens. You give them an auto gun, you jack them up on the dark gods, and you send them out. They're very, very, very cheap in terms of points. I can afford to lose tons of them. And Warhammer 40,000 being a D6-based system means you roll a lot of dice, you're going to break through and cause some wounds. So rather than leading with the charge of my berserkers, what if I have lots and lots of cultists? Flush those cultists out. Push those cultists forward. So you're building this, this checklist. You're building this checklist, and you're saying, here's how I, I am going to counter it. Now, sometimes you can't counter these things. Sometimes, based on the army list you're developing, you're like, you know, I just, I just don't have a counter to that. Um, an example, here's another example, pulling from Warhammer 40,000. 
uh, at the time, it's, it's gotten better. I was playing Tyranids. And Tyranids are like space bugs. Think Starship Troopers. Similar, I'm running across the table. I'm taking a lot of losses. Well, Tyranids at the time didn't have access to, to tanks. Um, their lower value troops, their lower value infantry space bugs hit a wall at some point. I mean, you, you were taking very, very cheap, effective close combat troops, but you couldn't get any cheaper. So I was looking at this list and saying, playing a close combat Tyranid army, I'm going to flood you with space bugs. We're having a similar problem like with my berserkers. You're going to be shooting, 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 shooting. I don't have transports. I don't have cheap troops. I can't eat three or four turns of shooting. So if this now leads to, if you can't stop your opponent from doing something, I couldn't stop my opponent from shooting at me, how do you tie them up? If you can't counter it, how do you keep them busy with something else? So I was able to, based at the time, pick certain units that either teleport in or burrow up through the ground immediately in my opponent's lines, into their battle line. And by taking two or three of these units, they pop up immediately turn two. The entire army is going to be shooting at them. My opponent's entire army in their deployment zone is going to be shooting at them. It's a complete loss. I'm not going to do any damage, really. But my opponent needs to make a decision. You've got space bugs bombing in. You've got brain bugs bombing in. Coming up, teleporting, dropping uh, space spores and all that type of stuff. Deal with that or shoot the gaunts and gene stealers running at your front lines. You can't be at two places at once. What's the immediate threat? So there was this idea that I can't stop the shooting, but if I can redirect it, and now you deal with the stuff that suddenly appeared in your deployment zone, and then I'm hitting you next turn. So in building that checklist, if you can't, you're like, I, I just don't see a counter, then can you keep your opponent's army busy for a turn or two? Those are the two elements. That's the starting point in building this checklist for playing a weaker army. And that's what you need to explore based on your army and the rules.